Okay, with that, uh, I'm very glad to introduce Celeste from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And uh, she has a long career with Lawrence Livermore National Lab, uh, which is a national security uh, lab in the East Bay, California. And uh, she's a computer scientist with 30 years career with National Lab. And uh, uh, her research primarily is on the data science, applies the data science and analytics technology for different global security issues. Uh, but 10 or 15 years ago, she started and uh, uh, applied the data science technology into the cybersecurity. And uh, she is a PI, a principal investigator and a researcher in cybersecurity situational awareness. And also she speaks frequently at the different uh, uh, workshops and uh, uh, technical conference, and especially uh, to help promote the diversity and the inclusion for women in data science and women in cybersecurity. And the one last thing I have to mention is that she's an avid backpacker and a backlist, and uh, she has done the transcontinental bike journey from San Francisco to Virginia Beach while in 2005. So with that, let's welcome Celeste to give the talk about the cybersecurity research from a data scientist perspective. Okay, Celeste, I'm going to hand this over to you. Uh, sharing my screen. Welcome everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Are we uh, showing the screen? Are we good? Okay, good. Uh, good. I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, Lawrence Livermore is in is about 50 miles to the east of Stanford, and this is our campus here. Uh, and we are a national security laboratory. And I've had a very fun and exciting career there. And I'm going to share. Uh, some of my uh, 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 some of my insights here, but I'm going to start with a bunch of taxonomy, so you have the context for which I'm I'm coming from today. And first, I know the word data science is a little overloaded, so I wanted to make sure you knew my perspective of it. And here, data science is really getting scientific insight from data, but it's the discipline of bringing multi-different approaches from different uh, types of scientific methods and algorithms and the approach to extract knowledge and data. So it's really the whole, the whole journey from the data, from the data analytics, and the algorithms and methods as well. Most of research includes you know, data analytics. And here, I just want to make sure that when we talk about data science, we're talking about the whole process of, of, of using the data methodologies as well. And the approach really here is that I've been advocating is really data-driven uh, computational data analysis for cybersecurity. So from the research side, I just want to um, give the perspective of what I'm thinking about when I talk about cybersecurity research. Now, and I, I don't want to, I want to make sure you understand that cybersecurity operations and cybersecurity software development and activities are essential to moving us forward. Um, research, in my opinion, complements everything we learn from the cybersecurity operations and development side of the house. The, the things I think about from a research point of view is how to think about a more generalized solution, uh, solutions that are not only about the existing current technology, but say three to five years out. So trying to anticipate uh, and understand uh, the implications of our, our activities in the three to five year term, uh, term where many of the um, you know, uh, development and cybersecurity um, uh, uh, operation people are really addressing current needs. So, so one of the differences in the perspective here is that research is trying to think, uh, you know, three to five years out. At least that's what I mean research here. I don't mean that it's not applied and I don't mean it's, you know, not practical. I just mean that we're trying to think about how to uh, understand the foundational understanding of the principles behind why things work the way they do. And for me, I think cybersecurity is like physics in the 1900s. It's we're really at the foundational point of trying to understand how things work in a, a fundamental way. And research is really uh, trying to make sure we don't lose the forest from the trees, that we also are look, looking about 
how things work, not only how to get things done, and are complementary. So a lot of ways I think about research here as a more strategic view and uh, operations and development activities are more tactical, both very essential and complementary. So with that, I want to, uh, the rest of my talk is mostly a survey uh, and a discussion about uh, research perspectives, and we'll give some, I'm really hoping to give some examples of the research thinking around things that maybe uh, you've heard about or are practical concerns for you and sort of explore research things. But um, from a data science point of view, cybersecurity is a fascinating place. Uh, one, there's lots of data, just massive amounts of data, uh, the, and, and that's actually not necessarily always a good thing. Uh, there's so much data, but maybe not a very strong signal. If you think about the amount of data that transits a network at the Livermore, we have petabytes of data that just comes across the enterprise boundary, and a very small fraction of that is actually malicious in any way. So there's a huge amount of very... Um, you know, you know, useful data, and we have to find those little things in all this other data. So there's lots of challenges. The other interesting thing uh, about this topic is that it uh, has a temporal domain, so it's dynamic, whereas you may find a solution to one threat, um, but the adversary moves very quickly, and so there's a new threat. So there's always um, opportunities to explore uh, new challenges, just because you get it fixed once doesn't mean it stays fixed. And just because uh, you found a solution for one thing doesn't mean it applies to everything. So good job security for cybersecurity. Uh, and that's a good thing and a lot of fun and always very interesting. There's never a dull moment. The other thing uh, I think we are more aware now, especially as we're all home doing our, uh, you know, teleworking, uh, the, the importance of cybersecurity because we are so, so much connected to our network. Uh, and the fact that the, the adversary is getting very sophisticated. Not only are they uh, more sophisticated just because of skill level, but the advancement of tools for the adversary, for the criminals, they actually have a whole set of, you know, sophisticated software engineering tools that make it easier for them to um, cause malfeasance. So there's always new threats and uh, new uh, things coming along. And... Um, the the rate of change, you know, uh, is very high. Uh, you know, if you just think about this past few months, you know, prior to March, the amount of people using Zoom was probably a small percentage. And now after March, you know, all of a sudden there's massive change. So, so behaviors change rapidly to address new needs, new interests. And so that um, and the amount of, of applications that are out there. Just think about the number of uh, apps in the app store at any one time. If you had to do a full software assurance process to approve every single app at the rate of change at which new apps are coming on, it becomes a pretty daunting task. And then finally, you know, in the old days when, uh, you know, we used to talk about defense and depth and there was very clear boundaries, you know, the castle analogy of, you have your moat and you have your perimeter. Uh, that's not so clear anymore. These networks are blurring. When I can sit, you know, in my office and uh, have my phone with me, or uh, and have you know multi different approaches to getting to different networks, I'm bridging, you know, corporate network environments and uh, OT environments and mobile environments. And so there really is no clear perimeter or boundary. And the sort of you know, everything outside of my enterprise or outside of my operational network is outside and everything is inside is no longer a valid uh, way of protecting. So I think we have to think about that everything is one big. Now we're at home using our corporate computers. We're using our home computers. We have our all our smart devices and all our OT and IT devices. So these networks have merged. So it causes us all these challenges causes us to really think differently about how to solve this problem. I think this kind of thinking of bringing data science in, we're seeing it being very popular uh, around uh, for other disciplines, and I just want to um, pursue it and, and explore some of the topics as it applies to cyber. Any questions?
you have a question, please uh, click the button in the middle, which is raise a hand, then I'm going to unmute you. Because we try to make this more interactive with each other, so we're allowed to speak over the phone. Okay, I'm going to go through and give some um, more examples. So we have a common context and that we talk about some of these ideas a little bit um, together. So um, you may be in research, there's a lot of uh, discussions about behavioral analytics. And prior in cybersecurity, people talked about, you know, signatures. And signatures are the things at which are easily identifiable for which you can make a rule for. And for example, maybe you know that a particular computer address, an IP address, is where bad things come from. You can make a signature that says, I won't accept any uh, traffic from that IP address. And those signatures work very well, and they're very effective when you know those kinds of uh, well-defined things. But they're there are two sort of shortfalls of those. One, uh, the adversary is clever enough to change so that, that if they get blocked on one file name or IP, they move to another name. So if they called it malware one, they changed the name to malware two, and the rule that F said no more letting in malware one won't no longer work when we have malware two. And uh, the other thing is the rate of change uh, is, is difficult that it's not always uh, easy to find those kinds of simple rules. So people are augmenting, and I'm saying really make it clear, augmenting the things we know how to look for by rules by doing behavioral analytics. And I know I've walked around many of the cyber conferences and I walk to many of the vendors and I ask them, what is behavioral analytics? And I get like many different answers. So I just want to say here, when I talk about behavioral analytics, we're trying to understand what's going on and how the, the systems are uh, operating. And an example could be, as I il illustrate here, that maybe we have a historical view of our network. We've been collecting and monitoring of our network, and we know that computer A uh, regularly talks to computer B, so the finance department and the procurement department, and they have a likelihood of interacting at about 90%. And that uh, computer uh, A and C, over our historical view of the world, they um, interact, you know, 75% of the time. But computer uh, A and computer D, which is the supercomputers, the finance department and the supercomputers, they don't interact really at all, less than 5%. So what we could do is if we monitor this and we see all of a sudden in the, finance, the computer and finance department, if it, its probability or likelihood of, of communicating with the supercomputers goes up to 90, we can say that's anomalous or that behavior has changed. The, the communication between those kinds of systems have changed. Now, what we can't say is that it's not easy to just because it's changed, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. There are many reasons why computer A may have been reallocated to a, a researcher and that their role is to communicate with the supercomputers. So it takes a little more interacting, but the idea here is the behavior here is the sort of connectivity, and the likelihood of connectivity. And there are other kinds of behaviors like uh, which URLs you go to or, or, you know, use a modeling in terms of what applications you use and processes. So these are kinds of things we talk about when we talk about behavioral analytics. And there, here's an example. There's another thing in research people are talking a lot about um, machine learning applied to cybersecurity. So I want to give you just a quick example. Here, you want to, if you wanted to explore how to determine from data that you can identify web attacks. Maybe you want to know whether you have an attack or not attack. So these two classes. Is something an attack, uh, SQL injection or cross guide scripting or one of these kinds of attacks? You actually could process the URLs and the traffic and um, process them in such a way that you can build a model to be able to make this two sets of classes. And we've done this using term frequency approaches that is like bags of words and looking at the frequency of bags of words. And the interesting thing is the, these kinds of web attacks use programming language concepts. So 
you know, if you're doing a SQL injection, there's actually SQL commands, and so you can classify them. If you have supervised learning or you have some labeled data that you know what kinds of commands are bad and kinds of good, you can actually use machine learning to build a classifier that's pretty accurate and can help you um, use these approaches to detect, uh, you know, these kinds of threats. And the good news is in, this, in these kinds of approaches, you can even get very fine grain. You don't only have to have two classes, is it an attack or not an attack. You can actually ask questions like, is it a SQL injection? Is it cross-site scripting? And these approaches are very good. Uh, so they augment the signature approach. The challenges of approaches like this is uh, they require something called supervised learning. And in this particular example, it means that you need to have data that somebody has labeled that shows you, if you want to do the multi-class, shows you what a SQL injection looks like, what a cross-site scripting looks like. So you have to have labeled data. And in most data science applications uh, in the world that I live in in national security, it's very hard to have labeled data. It's hard to have people who have able to label it. Or in the case of cyber, the time it takes to label it may overcome by the fact that the threat has moved to a new kind of threat. So the, the dynamic nature of it means that the efforts to do labeling doesn't always help you um, because then things have changed enough that that, that that kind of threat doesn't exist. The example I gave here, cross-site scripting is still very well used. So these kinds of examples would be well warranted in having uh, supervised learning, but not all cases do. Other kinds of, so again, I'm, I'm giving you a sort of a survey of the trends in research, and then we're going to dive in with some use cases and examples, so hopefully I can make this more concrete and uh, practical for you. So there's lots of other approaches in terms of uh, data science approaches for cybersecurity. Uh, if you wanted to do user modeling or you wanted to do understanding of how hosts should behave, you can do role-based uh, behavioral models, that, and that means you, you don't have to have the host, it don't have to know a priori that this is a computer in finance. You can observe it through data uh, acquisition and decide that it's uh, a, uh, the role of finance or the role of uh, a scientist. And those kinds of approaches can be a way to learn from the data rather than have people tell you. And, and this way, if rules change, you can use that as a way to alert your cyber defenders to maybe explore a little further. There's also, instead of the supervised models I talked about before, uh, there's also ways to do anomaly detection, which don't have the problem of needing uh, labels but have the problem of actually having to generate the models. So there's many different uh, generative models that one can use to build on maybe sort of the graph structure of the network, and you can use these for different kinds of detection problems. In many cases, and in the world, of, say, of OT worlds, you may data be constrained by data collection, and so um, these may not always be relevant, or you may have to use other kinds of networks to build the original models and then apply them in OT. And I think uh, we'll talk a little bit about this transferring uh, knowledge from you know, algorithms you create in one environment to another in a in slides going on, but there are a lot of challenges about the sort of transferring of knowledge here. Okay, so I'm going to now dive into a few specific examples and hopefully cover as many examples uh, as we can in the next few minutes to help reinforce this idea of what is it we look at from a research point of view, a data science research point of view. Any questions? The one thing that's hard in the Zoom is it could be you're all asleep and I can't tell. <laughs> so, if you have a, any uh, questions, you have a, a two way to raise the question. One is you can click the button, which is a raise your hand. Then I'm going to unmute you to ask a question. Okay, we do have a couple of people who do have a question here. Let's see, Absolutely. John Fox, let me unmute you. Allow to talk. John? Thank you. Um, it would help, I think, understand some of the material on the previous slide if you gave an example. In other words, you, you talked about a couple models. One was, oh, you could detect by 
attributes of the IP or attributes of the message. Could you expand on some of these methods just a little bit with an example? Maybe go to one of your earlier slides and say, here would be an example of a problem and here's what this approach does to help us understand it. So would it be okay if I go through a few examples that I have upcoming and do try to do that specifically? That's perfect. And then if I, I haven't, that's if perfect. I haven't accomplished it, then you can ask me again. Yeah, I was just trying to imagine. I mean, those words were kind of theoretical for me, and I was trying to attach them to some kind of context of okay, practically, what would this be? But if you're going there, that's great. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Thank you. Any more questions, Liam? Uh, let's move on. Okay. So uh, one of the practical things people talk about for cybersecurity, it's a phrase that's come out, is continuous monitoring. And so that sounds, sounds great. And we can all agree that continuous monitoring would be a good thing uh, because periodic snapshots have their, you know, their weaknesses. For example, it relies on you know, being able to catch things at the, time, at the right time and you'll have gaps. And, you know, uh, as far as I know, uh, you know, adversaries don't necessarily uh, only uh, uh, attack at the time you are scanning their network, right? So they can attack at any time. So um, the Department of DHS even had a whole program called Continuous Diagnosis and Monitoring. So there's lots of things that one can think about from a practical point of view. You know, you want to do in asset inventory and resource, con uh, and resource constraints and do all these modeling. But really, what does it mean when you have to do continuous monitoring, right? So the problem could be uh, there's just lots of practical concerns. And from a research point of view, many of these are open-ended questions. Really, I mean, if you think about continuous monitoring, you think about a huge amount of data. And in many, I know in the laboratory we're in, people use their computers not just for the monitoring portion because they have real tasks they need to accomplish. So you can't put um, load on the network that would be substantial to continuous monitoring. Um, we have to understand that uh, how much does the network change and how do, not only do we need continuous monitoring, but we need to be able to explain these changes to uh, a cyber defender. And we're going to, you know, so some of the challenges we have to think about is how to figure out how much data, when to collect, and how to make it uh, understandable, and knowing that in any practical situation, you're not going to have perfect visibility. And so how do you explore using these data, uh, automatic data approaches to uh, consider some of these popular topics like data, continuous data uh, monitoring? So a particular case um, that I worked on was this case of how to understand um, either for the purposes of knowing what, the, you know, a managed computing environment, I have to know what number of devices are on my network and what kinds of, uh, or if a rogue device is on my network. And, uh, and, and knowing that we're in a resource constrained environment. So, Simply, one of the things we did here is we used our normal vulnerability scanning approaches, but we changed the way we did it. And uh, uh, your organization may have, uh, you may do vulnerability scanning, uh, and it may be well known by your organization that vulnerability scanning happens every Wednesday. And uh, if, you, if you are well known about that, that could mean that you miss the other days of the week uh, also could mean that you um, uh, people can be you know can learn how to game the system. So one of the things we did here is we connect uh, collected uh, we we monitored our network. We found what were the we did an analysis of all the data and found out that there were periods throughout the day that we could collect uh, different kinds of activities. So during the day, user behavior during the evening, uh, server behavior like backups, and that we could vary, one, our data collection strategy and our vulnerability strategy so that it was randomized and not deterministic, and that it improved our ability to detect uh, 
uh, the, the threats that were coming in uh, by a significant amount. It also actually improved our ability of not having users um, game the system. And what I mean by that, there were people in the in, who legitimately want to get their job done, and they may have a FileMaker Pro database on a Windows Vista machine that goes back to, you know, 2000. And under the current practices, those operating systems and applications are no longer supported or allowed, and they're out of compliance. But they learned that with uh, scanning happening every Wednesday, they just had to shut their computer off, and they never got outed, right? They never got caught. Um, but by having more randomized uh, approaches, and actually, um, you, you didn't have to count uh, uh, continually monitor, you could actually pick, um, you know, periods of the day that got the broadest behaviors, and that's by monitoring it in advance and then building a model using uh, uh, the analysis of what hours of the day could you see different things like uh, all the different users connecting with each other. And, uh, and for example, at Livermore, we found that if we regularly collect the data around 11 a.m., between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. for user behavior and between 2 and 3 in the morning for like server behavior, if we snapshot those periods of time and then, and then periodically sample through the rest of the network during the rest of the day, we actually had a good, useful model of our network. So here we address the amount of data and we address uh, how we did it. So the con operations, the operations of how we did it, and that made a huge difference in our ability to um, identify threats and in particular know about all the assets that were on our computer and and then build the model for how we and, and build the model for how we could find um, non authorized or unmanaged devices on the network. But when we did this work there, it seemed very straightforward to ask these questions about uh, how do I identify the important changes in my network. So it seems it seems straightforward. I want to understand my network and I want to know how it changes. That seems really straightforward, but it actually ends up being a very open-ended question. So from a cyber defense point of view, change, what does change mean? What is important changes? And the reason why this is important is because uh, our cyber defenders don't want to be alerted constantly because then it becomes useless, right? They want to have, we want to be able to triage for him the most important changes. So if you ask yourself to understand what, what are important changes, um, there are lots of different uh, kinds of challenges that come, come to bear. So um, going back to an earlier question, we can, we'll, we're going to talk about what kinds of things can change. And maybe for our cases, we have to get specific about what data we collect. So network properties can change. And then what are the changes in these properties could be, for example, what are network properties? Network properties could be the communication volume, so the number of links to the number of hosts to number of devices. Uh, the communication distributions, like what protocols are being used and where, and the communication patterns, who's communing with, computing with, communicating with whom. And these are features we can collect and understand and build uh, distributions for, and then use these distributions to help us identify changes. Now, there are other, um, other interesting things and in what we've been approaching, and there's lots to learn here, and I don't want to let you, uh, once you believe that this is all done, there's lots of things still to learn, but we have to start coming up with approaches to understand how do we determine normal and how do we build, so maybe a normal distribution isn't the right model, but there are different kinds of models we could use to determine normal. And maybe in some cases there's decision thresholds we can use to find uh, the interesting changes, right? Uh, but itself the concept of normal changes over time. So maybe one of the things we have to think about is not just building a network model once and using it forever, how do we build into our approach that we not only have to do data collection, but we also have to regenerate these models. So the idea here from a practical point of view, you've done some monitoring, you figure out what kinds of things you can collect. And, they are, and in each network, you may have to decide which are the most, you know, the top 10 things that you want to collect or the top three. 
uh, and you can do some feature engineering to help you do that. And then you also have to think about at what cadence or at what um, rate do you actually have to rebuild models for which if you made a decision threshold, it's due valid. And so these are, uh, and, and I think for cybersecurity in general and for this kind of research, uh, the one of the things that we really don't have a good idea about is do, say I learned by these kinds of questions, I can answer these kinds of questions for Lawrence Livermore's network. Uh, does it apply if I wanted to apply it to General Electric's network, another big corporation? So this idea of if my model is only good for me, or is it only good for me at this time, or is my model also generalizable to be useful for other people? Uh, this idea of transfer learning uh, is still very much an open question. There's some thinking that maybe like organizations, maybe the model I built here at Lawrence Livermore would be suitable for an organization that's their a sister organization that's like us, say Los Alamos, but maybe not so much for an organization like Apple who's who may be different than us. And so I think these are things we have to start thinking about. The other uh, I think one has to think about and we sort of worked hard about and I mentioned a little bit is how to, to accomplish your data, you know, data monitoring in the concept of um, very different um, time uh, behavior. So you can have gradual changing in the network that you know, just in general changing you know, and maybe all of a sudden the use for um, the use of Zoom when it wasn't popular before is more of a sudden but now persistent change. So there's gradual changes like people move away from one technology to another. There's instantaneous sudden changes. And one has to think about um, data collection and data analytics with these time frames in mind. And a lot has to do with how to build uh, approaches to do that. And then I just want to reinforce because at Lawrence, we're very much uh, rooted in making sure our research is applied and we work very closely with our operations and infrastructure teams uh, so that we are not uh, in some ivory tower. And many of the things that we have to do is not only that we can, we have these algorithms that can detect these important changes, but we actually have to be able to explain, you know, where, what, how, and that really drives what data we collect. I mean, explainability becomes important. And so often things like I mentioned before, the behaviors of using a protocol distribution and communication patterns, these tend to help us be explainable. Not all features we would collect uh, lead to good explainability and we may not choose to use them um, because of that. And that's a trade-off space that one has to look at in terms of accuracy and trade-off. Uh, so that's one example that was that whole continuous monitoring, but I want to also give a few more examples here uh, around sort of standard best practices for cybersecurity, and many of these have heard about, but I want to take a public service announcement here first. So my public service announcement is that we know in cyber that user training is one of the most important things we have to do, and that's a well-known best practice, and I want to reinforce that. But now I want to talk about some research ideas around other known best practices. So many of you um, have heard or have experienced that patching systems or patching your applications is important and is a very effective cybersecurity uh, best practice. But let's dive into um, this idea of having to patch. And so, it, it sounds, again, it's one of these things that we all agree it makes sense to patch. But if you were to be responsible for a very large scale operational network or OT network that had hundreds to millions of devices, and each, uh, you got a notification of a critical firmware update that had to happen, and each, critical, each firmware update took a minute, it took 10 minutes, whatever time it took, it takes some amount of time to get done. So you can't instantly do it uh, because one, it requires downtime for the device and two, um, just saturation of networks and resiliency issues can't make it done. You ask yourself, well, what are the most important devices I would have to patch first? And, uh, 
And so I actually um, worked on this project here at Livermore. What is given uh, resource constraints, like uh, not, uh, not being able to take the whole network at once, not having enough resources to, to do the patching instantaneously, so given resource constraints, what networks, what devices would I patch first? What are the most important devices? And so I naively started off with, well, I'll go ask people. And so I did. I went and asked all the organizations to give me the list of their most important devices. And uh, of course, when I went to the finance department, their their servers and devices were the most important. And when I went to HR, their so, but nobody really had a way to intuit were there underlying things that people didn't know about that were important? You know, were there services and uh, devices that people didn't know about were important? So again, this idea that everybody just gets this mandate that we should patch, but the the operations folks don't only really often, or most of the cybersecurity controls don't often tell you how to go about doing it, right? And so we're often struggling each individual organization has to struggle with what's the right way to do this. So uh, we, we approached this from a data-driven point of view. We uh, did data collection and uh, in a way similar to what I said in the previous continuous monitoring discussion, where we observed the network for a, a period, a short period of time to figure out how we could uh, monitor it within a resource constraint, which we didn't have to do bazillions amount of data collection over a long period of time. And then we uh, looked at things like uh, uh, these, those communication patterns, and we call that centrality measures, and we found ways to identify are there nodes in the network of this large collection uh, that we um, didn't know about that everything is relying on or some some important things are relying on and then we were able to create uh, through a data different approach a bunch of important uh, ordering a ranking of important and, and we didn't actually just do one to end we just we decided you know to use binning like a, a critical high importance a medium and low importance uh, and it is context dependent. Sometimes the nature of the threat will factor in there. And through this binning, we were able to validate with the, the subject matter experts to actually help improve to have a strategy for which we could get uh, critical patching done in the most effective way to improve our security posture against that threat. And so here's this idea that, you know, everybody says go and patch. The research side of the house is, well, how do we go and patch and go and patch and make sure that we're doing this in the most effective way and having this data driven approach has given us a way uh, but i do want to let you know that it's not a uh, once and done we actually have to continue looking at the data the network in this way so that we can uh, as in the early work we can understand how things change so that we can kind of get a cadence of how often one may have to think about uh, reevaluating the importance of devices should a new patch come out. All right, I'm going to move on to another example. Any questions so far? Again, uh, if you have questions, you can uh, raise your hand. There's a button uh, down in the middle. Okay, well, maybe I'll go to the next example, and maybe this will I'll give you an, the next example, and we can uh, see if that generates any questions. Okay, so one of the most important uh, controls that uh, NIST mentions for managing a computer network or uh, OT or IT network is something called segmentation, and that's the dividing up of the network into uh, different subnets or enclaves, sometimes they're called. The idea behind that is you um, prevent spread of um, malicious behaviors, you, you lease privilege, you make sure only the people who need to have uh, that access to that subnet have access and stuff. So I've read all the controls and all the documents and, and I do know that segmenting is important, but there's nowhere in the controls to tell you how to do it. Um, and actually, there's nowhere in the controls to tell you that if you should just have to do it once, do you have to do it often? 
And so um, the challenge we learned uh, and explored here is from a research point of view, how do we give advice to our cyber defenders in order to figure out how best to segment a network for improved security? Now, you could choose to segment a network for many reasons. You can say, I want to segment the, because of physical proximity and have all the network for one building together. You can, fill, you can uh, segment a network because of who owns the equipment. Um, there's many reasons. But if we wanted to segment the network for security, we wanted to be able to give advice to, uh, to our cyber defenders and actually be mindful of the cost. I mean, it is non-trivial, uh, the cost of some of these approaches. Although as we move to more software-defined networking and new uh, approaches to network management, some of these things actually become um, um, programmable and controllable such that the cost is, uh, is lower. But in an imagine in an OT network uh, where things are pretty stable or could be pretty stable, if you were told to resegment, it could be uh, you know, a major effort, so you want to be mindful of the cost. So um, we had to understand and collect data to be able to uh, do some experiments from a research point of view in a lab so that we can think about how to do the segmentation. Uh, and again, we found that the things, things like the protocol distributions and the time of day where pouring connections were important. And what we also learned was that we used this uh, metric for the amount of connections, not only uh, the, the the, the distribution of protocols, but the amount of connections within each segment. And we developed a threshold that said, if the amount of connection, the communication uh, changes or gets beyond a threshold from, say, the amount of people who work within an, uh, an organization or a segment, they, they most, the reason they were in that segment is because they work more with each other. They communicate their hosts or devices communicate more with each other than they commuted, communicated outside the segment. So the intra uh, uh, communication was higher than the inter communication. And when that balance changed, we uh, looked at the cost and uh, the implications of uh, resegmenting. And what we found, and again, I want to just tell you that this is research and we have not done enough experiments to know if this is transfer, our experiments transfer to others. It's just that uh, what we found is that uh, segment, the need for segmentation does change over time and that there's a natural sort of uh, organizational movement, enough organizational movement that uh, warrants periodically looking at your segments and considering resegmentation. So it's not something that has to happen all the time, uh, but it definitely uh, warranted looking at uh, changing. And the idea is that if uh, the segments you want to all, all, you know, want to make sure that they're tightly uh, integrated. And often the way segments are created is they're firewalls to form these enclaves, so they're protected by uh, security devices. So you want to keep as much traffic inside the segments uh, that have that extra layer of protection through those firewalls. And then what's, once that, that starts to fall apart, that reconsidering when segmentation needs to happen. So we use the data-driven approach by collecting, figuring out um, these clusters of people using this measure of uh, reachability and amount of communications the volume and the number of connections uh, and use that to help decide which were the original segments. And then we were able to do periodically reevaluate um, which segments need to be uh, like clustered, different clustering of hosts or uh, devices uh, over time and how to do that in a way that we could provide to the operational teams practical uh, and understandable reasons why um, it was worth considering uh, resegmentation. Now, I have to say, uh, and this goes to uh, 
all the research I'm talking about, one of the most challenging parts of being a researcher in this field uh, uh, is this ability to validate. And so uh, whether it's because you're doing cyber threat detection and the threats are variable, or you're doing things like I'm talking about in terms of uh, organizational uh, changes like segmentation, you know, the, what def how do you define, uh, and I think part of what I go back to what I said earlier, these concepts of what defines more secure, what measures we use are still in their nascent and early stage. So it's hard to have ground truth to know um, if the approach that I'm taking is better or worse, and it is hard to do, um, you know, these, these uh, assessments. And so that's one of the challenges in this field is, you know, getting robust data sets and getting, um, you know, access to ways to evaluate it. And in many of the cases of the t things I talked about here, our initial evaluation was through subject matter expertise in terms of, and then in, in, as, we, as we were able to conduct these experiments, we were able to measure things uh, such as the uh, amount of lateral spread of a, of a, a known uh, adversary in a network when, when we had segmentation. But these things are very hard, and so uh, we are still in the early stages of trying to make sure we can do all these things. But uh, there are many different models. There are many foundational questions we still have to understand. Um, uh, I think we're sort of in the baby steps kind of phase here. Uh, I think there are some real practical things we as research can do that can help make things uh, explainable and find approaches that are enhancing to the things like signatures so that we can use anomaly detections and uh, other variations of things like that and, uh, and, and make progress. So uh, uh, I want to recap, and, uh, and then I'll take questions. But you know, really, this idea of situational awareness and where I sit in is what we believe, and the, the the sort of common understanding is that continuous understanding of your network is important. That is not as easy as it sounds. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of practical concerns about how much you collect and how do you evaluate all this data. There is lots of data in cyber, which is fun for me as a cyber as a data scientist. Uh, um, but sometimes that's not a good thing because we have to be able to uh, um, make use of it in a timely way because time to solution is very important in cyber. Research is needed uh, to advance the science of security. We've made a lot of practices, but as I was just saying, uh, we've made a lot of advances, uh, but there's still a lot of foundational things about uh, how the networks change, the rate of change from the network, uh, many constraints in terms of resources, uh, and that we as a group of researchers really have to um, push on these ideas of how to make sure we understand uh, uh, evaluation metrics and the metrics of what does it mean to be secure, and the cybersecurity community has to be thinking about these things, and really input from the operational community and the cyber defense themselves and from everybody working together. Um, as a researcher, this is a, so exciting. Uh, there's a ton of interesting research questions that are well grounded in practical needs and lots of fun. So if you have an interest in cyber research, uh, happy to be a research a resource for you. And I, hopefully I gave some examples here. I know this was a little bit more of a survey than a deep dive, and I will um, make available some papers if you want. Um, but there's a lot of uh, benefit from being able to combine multiple sources of data together and um, multiple data from the operational point of view, data from maybe um, more just quality of service kinds of things, data from cybersecurity tools, and combine them together. And just I want to reinforce that it is important that we make these uh, activities and the research we do yield actionable information for cyber defenders, that the goal really is to make and apply research approach. And that the sort of data-driven approach provides new insights and abilities to provide a way to explore the space that is not easily intuited 
given that computing networks and the behaviors of humans in computing networks or uh, devices in computing networks is very complex, is a very complex system that um, hopefully these data, data analytic approaches gives us a way to augment the knowledge that's in the subject matter expertise with uh, new insights that wouldn't normally have been able to be inferred. And, you know, it's not easy to intuit some of these, but these, you know, it's very hard to intuit if there's a critical device in a network um, because it's a back-end server and nobody knows it's there. With that, I'm going to stop uh, and uh, hopefully leave some time for questions. And a first priority to the person who asked the earlier question, and did I give an, enough examples or did you want me to go back? Thank you, Celeste. Terrific. Uh, so, John Fox, you ask the first question, then uh, let me unmute you, then uh, see if uh, you have more questions or Celeste has addressed your question. John? Yeah, you no, thank now. you very much. I mean, I'm coming at this trying to absorb this maybe in a more practical sense, but I think one example you had was very helpful. You said you can look at the type of network traffic, whether it's uh, peer-to-peer -peer or, you know, web, and you get an example of several categories. And so you could see that as a metric. You can just look at all the packets going out and sort of keep track of this. And if it changes in an anomalous way, you would say someone is using this in an atypical way. Did I, did I capture that aspect of this? Or yes, did I, that's uh, absolutely uh, correct. Okay. That's actually but correct. Then, but I want to be—I want to just be clear, just be clear. Just because it changes, it doesn't mean it's bad. Right. But it seems to me, I mean, these wrappers. Now, again, I don't understand all these protocols that well, but it seems to me it's pretty easy, in the same way that I can get spoof emails that claim to be from coming from places they're really not coming from. I can wrap my message with false headers, and I can wrap it up with all kinds of stuff to make it look like things other than what it is. And it would seem to me, maybe this is just the game you play, is that each approach has a countermeasure that somebody can get slightly more sophisticated, but you could use a variety of, of protocols or wrappers using some you know, pseudo-random method to choose when you're gonna do them, that you wouldn't see these as anomalous changes at all. You just see this as, you know, kind of white noise in the, in the distribution. So I don't, I don't know if, if that's too specific a question, but I'm just thinking how easy it would be to spoof some of this stuff. So let me address that specifically. I think one of the things that uh, is important to address that is in maybe more of the machine learning approaches that whereas signatures, it's, too, it's very hard to have multiple different parts uh, a rule that has many different parts. It gets too unruly. But with a machine learning approach or uh, an automated algorithm that is looking at it, you actually can parse maybe instead of just looking at the, the header, the, you can look at the details of the header. Maybe there's 56 different things or 75 different things if you parse, say, the header that you can now keep track of and make uh, a more uh, complex algorithm about. And so that's what we're seeing happen, is that it is true that there are wrappers and different ways you can use these protocols, but there's only so many ways that will actually work. And that if you have an algorithm look at the, not just one or two, three different uh, metrics in that, you can start seeing that if people, actually people give themselves away because they do the, the craziness Sort of consistently, so it's only you know, like the the developer will find a way to take apart the protocol and use it sort of uh, in a, a unique way. And even if they vary it a little bit, the machine learning algorithm can find statistically significant things. So the real issue there is that now with machine learning or algorithmic approaches to cyber defense, we can look at many more data elements and make our equations that look at anomalies a little more complex. And that's really what's happening to help with that uh, case of now people trying to spoof you by making things look alike. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, the, we still have a couple of questions coming, and uh, people can type your question from Q&A, or you can raise your hand. And the question from the Q&A portal basically is ask about uh, end-to-end encryption, which is kind of better practice for the industry for the security purpose. To what extent is use of encryption at odds with data science approach to detect cyber threats and more general to identify opportunity to improve security? So, um, you know, end to encryption definitely makes things uh, better and more secure and definitely a best practice. But there are also uh, kinds of things that one can look at from a data science view. So, uh, if you look at end to end encryption, you still can see that, that somebody is connecting to some, some device is connecting to some of that. So, maybe it's not just you're looking at the content, but you're looking at the structure, or maybe some of the things I talked about, those communication patterns. And even with encryption, you still are able to figure out some of the things like the protocols, and there's some header information. So I believe, uh, and, I, and I think encryption makes it uh, uh, more, uh, more challenging and good uh, in terms of uh, protection. But there are also, um, you know, just different ways of looking at it. In particular, uh, stru the structural or topological connections, more like a graph analytic problem that comes in. And we have a paper called Guilty by Association that sort of explores these more structural elements of using um, the aspects of what you can see when you can't see the content to help you um, protect your network. Thank you. We are now approach 2.30 before I cl uh, close and wrap it up. I have a last question for myself. Is, uh, uh, Celeste, I know that you uh, led or maybe still lead the uh, data science uh, cybersecurity summer internship program. Can you tell a little bit about, about uh, that program, especially for Stanford oh. students? Because 90%, maybe 80% of our students have taken data science or machine learning one one. I think they will be very interested about the internship opportunity. So uh, I will point to their stu your students to the Data Science Summer Institute. It's called DSSI at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, this year, the program is already full, and the program will be fully remote. Um, but for future reference, and it doesn't only have to be during the summer, we we are we can have students working with us throughout the year. So we that Data Science Summer Institute and the Cyber Defender Program are programs of which to apply data, the kinds of data science challenges I've talked about to cybersecurity. Uh, and it is a cohort group where students get together with their colleagues um, to explore. And when students come to the laboratory, they have access to the lab data, which we can't get out normally. So they get to be, because they're, some, they're employees during the summer uh, or when they're interns, uh, they get access to all this fun stuff I was telling you all about. So, uh, it, it, I would again, that Data Science Summer Institute (DSSI), uh, and there's a website about some existing projects or previous projects, um, and that would be the best resource. And then uh, I put, did put my uh, contact information on the slides, and I'm happy to entertain questions about the stuff I talked about and or any internship opportunities at Lawrence Livermore. Thank you, Celeste. Really, really appreciate it. I think this is slightly different as traditional power system talk, but it's really open eye and give us some additional thoughts how we can do the continuous uh, monitoring, network segmentation type of techniques for power systems. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thank you for everyone.